The PlayStation VR 2 is the virtual reality upgrade console gamers have been waiting for. But is it really worth $550? I think that really depends on how much you need high-end, high-quality VR. The PSVR 2 is just really arriving at a strange time for the virtual reality market. Things just look very different today than it did back in 2016 when the Oculus Quest and uh, the HTC Vive and the original PlayStation VR first launched. There was just a ton of excitement around VR back then. Putting any of those devices up to your eyeballs was like looking at the future of computing. And a lot of us thought, myself included, that if VR took off, we'd eventually see augmented reality glasses, which could incorporate digital elements on top of the physical world. Clearly, none of that has happened yet. Meta is losing a ton of money from its virtual reality segments, and developers just aren't really pumping out as many VR games as they used to. Now that much of the excitement around VR has kind of died down, the PSVR 2 just seems like more of a curiosity than a must-have gadget. It has all the hardware you'd want from a next-gen headset, but it also costs more than the PlayStation 5 itself. And Sony is also saying there are going to be 30 games in the March launch window, but really who knows what's going to happen down the line. Will this be something people are actually making games for in a year or two? And I think the bigger thing is the MetaQuest 2 just really changed the landscape for VR. For 400 bucks, you can get something that'll get you right into virtual reality, doesn't need any wires, um, and that's a pretty good deal even though Meta raised the price by 100 bucks last year. But you know what? After spending a lot of time with the PSVR 2, I can't help but be impressed by it. It just feels like it's coming at a bad time. It has a ton of features and all the high-end VR features you'd want. It also has something we don't see in a lot of headsets these days. That includes eye tracking. Um, you know, the only major consumer headset that has that is the MetaQuest Pro, and that thing is $1,500. And it also has something I've never seen before in a virtual reality headset. Haptics for your head. Before we get that though, let's talk about the PSVR 2 itself. It really does look like an evolved form of the original model, but I think there's a lot more going on here. The first PlayStation VR looked more like a toy than a premium product. It was very bulbous. Um, it just felt like there was a lot going on there and it didn't help that you know the Move Wands had these little colorful balls on them. The whole thing just felt like a bit of a joke, a bit of a toy from Sony. The PSVR 2, on the other hand, feels like there's actually some artistic design going on here. It's sleeker, it's slimmer, I wouldn't be surprised to see this product featured at MoMA or other modern art museums down the line. And yes, it's still made of plastic, but you know what? It's very good plastic, it's the same stuff that's used on the PlayStation 5's outer shell and on the DualSense controllers, so cohesively, it all just kind of fits together now. Whereas I think before, the PSVR felt like an outlier against the black PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 4 Pro. I also really didn't care about the plastic material too much since the internal hardware has gotten such a major upgrade. The headset features two 2K lenses, uh, they're both on separate eyes. Together that makes a 4K image that just looks incredibly sharp. And Sony also upgraded the field of view by 10 degrees, so now it's 110 degrees, which brings it a lot more in line with PC VR headsets. It still displays either 90 hertz or 120 hz refresh rates, but thanks to the power of the PS5, I think it can actually deliver that performance. The PS4 kind of had to do a lot of interpolation to look smoother for VR. Up front, you'll find four sensors that track the headset and its new sense controllers. And thanks to these inside out sensors, which are also the sort of things we see on PC VR headsets, the PSVR 2 doesn't require a PlayStation camera to track its movement like before. Along the top, there's a button to extend the front half of the headset as well as a dial to adjust the pupillary distance. It does so by physically moving the lenses to match the distance between your eyes, and that's something that was sorely missing from the first PSVR. At the bottom, you'll find a small microphone, power button, and a selection button. To get audio, you'll have to plug in the bundled earbuds along the back of the headset. There's nothing stopping you from using your own headphones or earbuds, but I imagine the cable situation would be pretty messy. Getting the PSVR 2 on your head thankfully hasn't changed much from before, and that's a good thing. I think the original PlayStation VR was one of the most comfortable VR headsets I've ever held. This time around, it still has a lot of plush cushioning along your forehead, and there's a nice amount of cushioning on the back, and the whole thing kind of just splits out, and you lift it over your head, you secure everything, and you tighten it down with the dial. I think it just fits really well. Um, you know, I wear glasses and it still fits just fine. And the weight is balanced really well too. The headset itself is pretty light, but I also think weight distribution is something a lot of VR headset makers haven't really thought about. My only feature request is a pop-up headset. Um, I really like that on the Windows Mixed Reality headsets. It made, you know, just seeing what's going on in the real world much more easy, and it made putting headsets on and off a lot easier than trying to wrangle this thing. 
I'm also pretty happy that Sony listened to all of our complaints about the Move controllers with the first PlayStation VR. Remember, those things started out as sort of uh, accessories for dance games and, you know, mini games. They weren't really meant for VR. Now Sony has purpose-built Sense controllers, which are all about virtual reality. They're practically a carbon copy of Meta's Quest controllers with a large tracking ring, analog sticks, two face buttons, triggers, and grip buttons. They both also have haptic feedback, PlayStation buttons, and they also split the sharing and option buttons found on the DualSense. Overall, I think these controllers are a huge step up. They're just a little annoying to put on when you're blinded in VR. Not every game shows you where the controllers are. And uh, because the design is so elaborate, it's hard to figure out which hand is which and how to actually get your fingers in there. But you know what? Every time I got frustrated with those controllers, I took a breath and just looked at how easy the setup process is compared to before. There's no breakout box or anything else necessary to run the PSVR 2. You just have to plug in the USB-C cable to the front of the console. That's it. After pairing my Sense controllers, I looked around my room to scan all of the objects. That just tells the headset, you know, where there are obstacles. You know, I have a coffee table here, I have chairs behind me. It showed me where there's actually clear space to play VR. I appreciate being able to actually manipulate where the boundaries of that play space is. And uh, once it's all set, it uh, basically gives you an alert every time you start to step out of it or wave your hand out of it to tell you that, hey, you may end up hitting something. That's something every VR platform does, but it is really implemented very well here. And as with pretty much every VR headset, you could choose to play sitting down or standing up. I started out just standing up because really, if you're playing games like Horizon VR, Call of the Mountain, you're gonna wanna be standing up and moving around. You know, you're gonna feel more like a post-apocalyptic warrior if you're actually moving about. Horizon VR ended up being the perfect showpiece for this headset because it just really shows off all the different features really well. As soon as the game loaded up, I was just wowed by, you know, the colors and the actual environments. Everything just looked crystal clear on those lenses, and uh, it definitely felt like a big step up over the PlayStation VR 1. I really appreciate the rich color from these lenses, and there's also a ton of contrast, so it's bright but not too bright. And I think that really just shows off the advantages of the OLED screens. You know, you can actually get pure blacks on the screen. You can't get that on a lot of LCD headsets, including the MetaQuest Pro. Now, I'm no stranger to the detailed environments in the Horizon games, but I think Horizon VR really takes things to another level because you're actually in it. Things are up against your face. You know, um, early on, I encountered some of the actual uh, machine monsters up close. The game also involves a lot of climbing, and that's something that, and, you know, we've seen before in the Climb VR and a lot of other games, but it works really well here. I really like the mechanics of moving around. And uh, it definitely gave me a sense of vertigo, too. You know, if you're in a headset and you're on the side of a cliff or looking down the side of a mountain, you feel it because that's all you can see. It does a good job of replacing your reality and giving you a good sense of presence, which is what we want from every VR headset. Horizon VR also uses the eye tracking on the PSVR 2 to help you select menu options. So it was kind of cool just to move my eyes around um, to choose things. It felt like almost like a superpower. And it also relies on foveated rendering like a lot of other games. And that basically concentrates the graphical horsepower of the PlayStation 5 to the exact thing you're looking at. So, you know, things on your peripheral vision uh, won't be rendered as uh, high resolution, but you probably won't even notice. That's a good way to get more performance from a lot of games. It'll also be a big help as the PS5's hardware starts to age over time, you know. It's pretty fast now, but in a couple of years, it'll feel slow compared to typical computers. As I was playing the game, I was also surprised when the headset just started rumbling around me, especially when some of the larger, um, you know, creatures started coming right up to me. That's not something I've ever experienced in VR before, and it does a good sense of uh, making you feel more immersed in the environment. I imagine a lot of games are going to rely on, you know, the headset haptics just because it is so new and unique. It's very similar to the DualSense haptics uh, that we saw when we reviewed the PlayStation 5. Um, and maybe some developers will lean overboard with it, but right now I think it's being used pretty well. The opening scenes of Jurassic World Aftermath, for example, puts you in a plane as it's about to crash, there's a pterodactyl attack, and you see a T-Rex, um, you know, eat somebody right in front of you. You feel those sounds of dinosaurs and you feel all that movement. And it just felt really good. It may not be something everybody would want, you can always turn that feature off. But to me, it felt like the sort of thing we've been waiting for in VR for a while. Um, we've seen VR haptic suits before, but this built into the headset is entirely new. 
Sony's new VR tracking technology um, also feels pretty mature. You know, I didn't run into any of the tracking issues I had on the original PlayStation VR, because remember that was a whole elaborate setup that needed a PlayStation camera, which looked at the move controllers and looked at the lights on the headset. Right now, things are just a lot smarter and um, I like that it was pretty seamless. It was great for faster paced games like Res Infinite, but it also worked out pretty well for slower paced titles like Tentacular, which require a lot of slow and fine movement. That game puts you in the role of a giant tentacle monster that's helping out a town and you're taking on odd jobs. You know it's hard enough to have tentacle hands, but it would be even tougher if the motion tracking didn't work properly. Now Sony knows how to make a good controller, so I wasn't surprised that the Sense controllers felt really good, even though I was playing them for you know several hours on end. Uh, they typically lasted around four hours um, before they needed a recharge. And if you're a big VR head and you plan to be in this a lot, I'd recommend picking up the $50 charging bay uh, for the controllers where you could just plop them down, have them ready to go every time. Otherwise, you'll have to remember to plug them into USB-C cables every time you're done. When you're not gaming, the PSVR 2 also makes a pretty great personal cinema. That could be useful if you're sharing a TV, you can always have the headset on and have somebody else watching their own show. And uh, I just really enjoyed that experience. Looking at videos is sort of like uh, sitting in front of a 100 inch screen while you're five or six feet away. So it's pretty immersive. It's certainly bigger than most TVs. It just felt good. I was able to watch a lot of YouTube videos, Netflix and Blu-rays, and uh, you know, it just felt very immersive. It's not my ideal way to watch a movie because it's hard to drink or eat or do anything really in VR, but if you wanna be blocked out from the world and have a great cinematic experience, it's not that bad. As much as I enjoyed my time with the PSVR 2, it didn't really feel like I was playing a lot of the same VR games over and over again. You know what, I love Res Infinite. If you put that game in front of me, I'll play it gladly every single time. But it's also the same game we've seen since 2016. Sure, it looks sharper and it feels better and the haptics just you know really get you in the groove. Um, but it does feel like the actual library for VR and the ecosystem isn't as fresh as it was several years ago. Tentacular came out in the Quest 2 last year. The Jurassic World game is several years old. We're gonna be seeing some new titles uh, like Gran Turismo 7 and Resident Evil Village with VR support. So maybe that'll be interesting, but I'm hoping Sony really keeps this up because I'm not sure if developers are gonna stick with this platform or VR in general if people aren't buying these headsets. And that gets to my biggest problem with the PSVR 2, it's price. It's $550. That seems ridiculous. Uh, when you're spending $400 or $500 on the PS5 itself, it really just feels like you're punishing gamers. The original PSVR cost $500 if you bought it with the camera and the controllers, but its base price was 400 bucks, which seemed pretty fair at the time. If Sony actually wanted to you know, accelerate the VR ecosystem, I feel like the PSVR 2 should have been at least $400 um, or less, to be honest. And right now it just feels like Sony's trying to extract every cent of profit it can from this device, rather than making sure it's something people actually want. And really that price is hard to stomach now because the MetaQuest 2 costs 400 bucks. Remember it used to even cost $300. That gives you a really complete VR experience. And you can always plug that into PCs too to use for more high resolution games. I suppose Sony does look like it's giving you a deal compared to the $1,500 MetaQuest Pro, but that device is really meant for developers. It's not really meant for consumers. I just feel like um, they could have brought this down a lot. Now I'm sure the PlayStation VR 2 will come down in price eventually, but right now it just feels like Sony is kind of bungling this launch a bit. It almost reminds me of how Sony handled the PlayStation Vita, a wonderful portable console that was pretty innovative for its time, but Sony just never really gave it enough support to be super successful. I'm also hoping Sony adds support for PCs down the line. You know, I think a lot of people wouldn't mind spending this amount of money for a headset if you could actually use it for higher end Steam VR experiences. Maybe we'll see some third party drivers down the line, though pairing controllers may be a problem. I think it really comes down to this. If you're a PlayStation 5 owner who's been dying to see what PC VR enthusiasts have been playing for the last few years, sure, the PSVR 2 is a pretty solid upgrade. For everybody else though, I can't imagine spending $550 for this thing. Wait a couple years for it to come down in price and hopefully for more games to arrive too. And you know what? If the VR industry continues its current downward trajectory, that discount may happen even faster than you think. Stay tuned to Engadget.com for more of our console and VR coverage. If you dug this video, be sure to like and subscribe.